My beloved Providence, as we prepare for the message this morning, won't you join me in a word of prayer? Oh God in heaven, I pray for every household under the sound of my voice. I pray this morning, Lord, that you would tell and make a lesson for every one of our hearts and every one of our spirits. Lord, let the truths that you would learn to plant fall on fertile ground over every heart that shall hear my voice. And then, oh Lord, please help me as your teacher. God, please move me so far out of the way that the people of God would hear none of me and would only hear from you. This morning, we declare, Lord, that we want you to get all of the glory. But to your children, please leave to us the growth. God, I ask it all in the name of the one who saved us all. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ I do pray. Amen. Amen. My brothers and sisters of Providence, as we get into the sermon on this morning, I want you to know that I'm very excited about 2022. This year in 2022, I've got sermonic themes. Every month during this year, I'll be preaching to you from a different sermonic theme as we worry about our overarching idea of growing in wisdom and in faith. So, for the month of January, jot this down in your notes. Your sermonic theme for the month of January is confirming Christ after Christmas. Your sermonic theme for the month of January is confirming Christ after Christmas. This is going to be a three-part sermon series that we're going to preach here in the month of January. I'm going to preach you two sermons today and January 9th. Then on January 16th, we're going to pause on the theme as we honor the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in celebration and honor of his birthday, which we'll talk about a little later in the service. And then I'm going to come back the following Sunday, January the 23rd, and conclude the three-part series. So you're going to want to stay in touch with the messages all year long as we engage in the themes that we are going to do in all of the series that we are going to be preaching. So here it is. If you would turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John, the seventh verse, excuse me, the 16th chapter and the seventh verse, the Gospel of John in the 16th chapter in the seventh verse. And we're going to read the Gospel of John, chapter 16, from verses 7 to verse 11. Out of the New Revised Standard Translation, if you have it in your Bible, here's what it says. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin, because they do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father and you will see me no longer. And about judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. Amen. Friends, as a thesis verse for the message this morning, please look at the eighth verse in your Bible. Underline these words. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin, righteousness, and judgment. Brothers and sisters of Providence and all of our guests, on this first Sunday of the year 2022, as we begin our sermonic series confirming Christ after Christmas, let us open this series with sermon number one which is confirming I've been born again. Confirming I've been born again. Providence, it's a new year. And even though we are virtual, I want you to know how glad I am to be in worship with you. Because even though it's a new year, if you and I would be honest this morning, many of us still have old habits. There are some old habits that have followed us into every new year since time immemorial in our lives. And one, hold at, one old habit that we all have to admit that we have is to promise ourselves about what new thing we are going to do in the new year. Some people call these New Year's resolutions. Others call them New Year's promises. Some call them New Year's expectations. And it does not matter what you call it. All that matters is that you and I recognize it's an old habit that we bring into every year, claiming we're going to have a New Year's resolution. Every year about this time, 
We recognize that it's time to put something new in our lives. And we make a resolve in our lives about what new thing we are going to do. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to exercise more. I'm going to read my Bible more. I'm going to have more patience. Yada, 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 yada. We have all these New Year's resolutions. And so to honor that tradition this morning, what new thing that we are going to commit to spiritually, what new thing that we're going to recognize needs to be a part of our faith? is that you and I are gonna have a new resolution that we are gonna engage in the spiritual practice of confirming Christ after Christmas. This, brothers and sisters, is not just our theme for January. This is our new thing that we're gonna do in this new year. It is our New Year's resolution. We are, at the beginning of 2022, in our own spiritual lives, going to confirm Christ after Christmas. Well, Reverend Williams, what does that mean? Well, many of us have to admit that we are very good at confirming Christ during the Christmas season. We remember to engage in our Advent. We, we are reminded about Christ throughout the Christmas season. We sacrificially give to others for Christmas. We reflect on the previous year that we had with God. And then if you think about the month of December, in December alone, we have our Advent liturgies, we have our Angel Tree program, we had our season of service, we had our Christmas Eve service, and we had our watch night service. Brothers and sisters, it is really hard to be a member of Providence and engage in all the worship experiences that we have had during the month of December and not think about Christ. It's really hard during the Christmas season not to confirm your faith and affirm what you believe about Jesus and your fidelity toward God. But then all of a sudden January comes. January comes and we get busy ramping up for the new year. We get busy doing a new thing. And things move so fast with the new year and all that a new year brings that sometimes we have to admit every January, Jesus gets pushed to the back burner. Said a different way, it's so easy to focus on making the new year new that we leave stuff out in the old year and don't carry it forward into the new year. It's so easy to do that that we forget to press as hard in our faith in January as we did in December. To compound matters, our worship calendar makes it so easy to remember Christ in December and our worship calendar makes it just as difficult to remember Christ in January. So, so let's this morning confirm that Christ is in our lives after Christmas with the same passion that we thought about and confirmed Christ before Christmas. This is important because if you're watching me right now, if you're engaging in worship right now, then you have some level of faith and faith is important to you. You're willing to engage the unnatural to get access to the supernatural, which is why you are in worship right now. You believe or you want to believe that a God, a good God, knows the plans that God has for you in this upcoming year. And you want to connect with that God, which is why you are in worship right now. You want something greater out of your living. You want something that has depth of meaning and a purpose in your life. And God, through Jesus Christ, you and I believe by faith, can provide it for you if we can confirm Christ after Christmas. If we can confirm what it is we believe about God. And the very first thing that you and I ought to do if we're going to confirm Christ after Christmas, jot this down in your notes, is you and I have to confirm that we have been born again. Brothers and sisters, this is truly step one in our faith walk at the beginning of the year. You see, at the moment of salvation, at the moment that you have confessed with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you are saved. At that very moment, in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, so to speak, you have salvation. And step one, that salvation occurs in your life, is that immediately you are born again. That moment, whenever it occurs, that moment is the new year in your life. Because that moment when you accepted Jesus Christ, when you got saved, that moment was the beginning of a new year for you because it was the beginning of a new you. 
The moment before salvation, you were living your life separated from God. And the moment after salvation, you were sealed by faith to live with God for eternity. It was, if you will, if you remember your salvation, your salvific moment, it was a transformative moment in your life. But just because you and I go to church, how do we know that this moment occurred? So much of our faith occurs on the inside of us that, that it does not occur with a major sign or a major acknowledgement or recognition that it actually happened. I mean, how do I really know that I got saved? How do I know in that moment that I accepted Jesus Christ and the pardon of my sins? How do I know that my name was now written in the book and that I would go to heaven when I die? These are the existential questions that we begin this year, 2022 with, because if I'm going to grow in wisdom and faith, if I'm going to grow in wisdom and spiritual maturity, then I've got to believe what I know and I've got to know what I believe. I mean, wouldn't it be so much easier? If at every moment of faith in your life to confirm that you were doing the right thing, the thunder would roll and the lightning would flash. I mean, think about it. Every decision that you had to make, if you were going the wrong way, there'd be silence. But if you were going the right way, the thunder would clap, the lightning would flash, and you would know I've made a right decision. I am in the will of God. Wouldn't it be so much easier if there was a sign every time I made a decision for God, a sign that marked the fact that I knew that I was saved, a sign that marked the fact I knew I was going to heaven, a sign that marked the fact that I knew I had accepted Jesus Christ. Think with me about what life would be like if you got that sign. Here's the reason why you don't get that sign. You don't get that sign because what would happen if God actually gave you a sign to confirm what God's will was and you didn't do it? Or what would happen if God didn't give you a sign, which means you knew you weren't supposed to do something and you did it anyhow. You see, the reason why we can't have these signs is because God would get kind of frustrated with you and with me if you knew and I knew that we knew that we knew that we knew, not that we believed, but we knew and we still went the opposite direction. But I digress. How do we confirm on this first day of 2022 that we have been born again? How do we confirm the salvation that we believe in and the gospel that we profess to others? How do we know that we are walking with God? Jesus answers, I believe, this question in the 16th chapter of John. If you were to read the Gospel of John, by the time you got to the 16th chapter, you would recognize and realize that time is running out on Jesus's ministry. He knows that he will soon be leaving this limited womb called time and returning back to heaven to be seated at the right hand of the creator with all power in heaven and earth in his hands. He knows that he will be arrested and beaten and crucified. He knows what seeing this will do to the disciples' faith and how they will be feared. He knows that he's got to offer them some assurance that everything that he taught them is true in spite of what it's going to look like with him being crucified. He needs to offer them some insurance to cover them when their flesh gets weak and they make the inevitable wrong decisions that we all make. Say amen, somebody. So here in our text, in speaking with his disciples before he is arrested, I'm in verse seven. He says, I tell you the truth. Stop right there. Before you keep reading, look at the preface of his words in this seventh verse of this 16th chapter. The preface says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. In spite of what you are about to see, in spite of what you are about to hear from the Jewish ecclesiastical leadership, even in spite of what your eyes are going to tell you, believe for yourself that I am telling you the truth. In spite of your feelings, I am telling you the truth. In spite of the coming difficulties and the past tragedies, I am telling you the truth. The preface means that the words that are about to come out of my mouth, like every other word that Jesus ever spoke, are true. That what I'm about to share with you is real. It is the truth. This is what you can build your life upon. This is what is steadfast and immovable in this life. And all the things that you can't trust in this world and all the things that you can't depend on. This is the solid rock upon which we stand. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. What I'm about to tell you, these are the things that are never going to change in your life because the truth is the truth. We once thought that the world was flat, ladies and gentlemen, and at that time, that wasn't truth. It was our conjecture. And then at some point in time, after we thought the world was flat, don't you know scientists gained the equipment to be able to demonstrate that the world was a sphere instead of a cube? 
to confirm that you and I have been born on an earth that is round and not one that is flat. And in that moment, conjecture that the world was flat turned into truth that the world was round. I tell you that because to confirm that you've been born again, to confirm that salvation is real, Jesus is saying to you in this text, I'm not sure how much conjecture you have had to deal with in your life as it relates to your salvation. I'm not sure how much conjecture you have had to deal with about what it means to get saved or how do you know that you're saved or what you have to do to be in lifelong and life-loving relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't know what conjecture you've had to deal with, but nevertheless, what I'm about to tell you is the truth. I'm not sure who's told you how to get to heaven or if you're going to hell, but what I'm about to tell you is the truth. I'm not sure whose conjecture on what you should or should not do to be born again. But Jesus says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. I'm not sure what church hurt you have experienced as we ministers conjecture about the word of God, as opposed to simply teaching what it says. But nevertheless, Jesus said, I am telling you the truth. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. And here it is. The truth is, keep reading in the text, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. What? Can you imagine the disciples at the time? Can you imagine the incredulous look on their faces? Jesus, you are saying to us, it is to our advantage that the Jews murder you after a sham trial and a farce of an arrest. It is to our advantage that our leader leaves us and we are without the wisdom that you've given us for three years of ministry. You're telling us it is to our advantage that fear overtakes us, that persecution follows us, and we will be living our days doubting and wondering and never truly knowing because you will no longer be here to affirm and confirm that which we believe. That, Jesus, is to our advantage. Here in this particular text, the disciples are more than likely fearful and scared. Ministry with Jesus has become more and more dangerous. The more we walk with this brother, the more our lives have been put at risk. It went from being fun at the fish fry to frightening on Friday. And now this dude is talking about leaving. But here's the truth for your life and for mine. It's better, Jesus said, that I go away. Because the Lord said, if I go, I will send the advocate to you. And you and I are reading the text and we're saying, just like the disciples, Jesus, you got to come on by here sooner than right now and quicker than yesterday. And explain to me, how is it better for my life that you go away rather than you be here with me now? And Jesus says, I'm going to send somebody to you. It's better that I go away, that I send you the advocate, that I send you the comforter, that I send you the paraclete, the one that you know as the Holy Spirit. It's better that I go away so that you can get the Holy Spirit. Well, come on, Jesus. How, how is that the case? Watch this. I, Jesus, and my incarnate self, if I stayed with you for the, your lifetime as a human, eventually understand that I too am a human. So eventually my body would age and I would die as well. Or, rather than dying in my old age, having been with you disciples for 60, 70, 80 years, the other alternative is I could die for your sins. I could send you the Holy Spirit who is not incarnate. I could send you one who would never die. And then you could choose between having me for some years, 80 years of your life, and then I'm gone. Or you can have the Holy Spirit, who is me, by the way, forever. You can have the Holy Spirit for a lifetime and generations and generations to come after you can have that Holy Spirit all the days of their life. Jesus is saying in the 16th chapter of John, you can have me in the temporary or you can have the eternal. You can have the Holy Spirit in the eternal. You can have me in a fleeting moment or you can have the Holy Ghost for all the moments of your life. It is better for you that I go away. Verse 8. And when that Holy Spirit comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. 
There it is, brothers and sisters. Write it down. It's right there in the text. When the Holy Spirit comes, when you are born again and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, when you have made the decision to choose Jesus Christ in the pardon of your sins, when you have decided I no longer want to live my life separated from God, when you have made the most important decision of your life, when the Holy Ghost comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin, about righteousness, and about just judgment. In the decision moment, Jesus is saying, when you accept Jesus Christ into your life, when you believe in the Lord, when you confess the Lord as the Lord your God, when you let Jesus into your life, in that moment, when you choose to be connected with God and live with God, in that moment, that will be the greatest moment of your life because in that moment, the Holy Ghost will or has come upon you. For those of you who are saved, who know Christ and the pardon of your sins, it is the moment that occurred in your yesteryear when you accepted Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost came upon you. And for those of you who may not know Christ this morning in the pardon of your sins, it is the moment that is coming in just a moment in this sermon. It is the moment when I offer Jesus to you and you say yes, and the Holy Spirit shall come upon you. And to confirm that you've been born again, to confirm that you are walking into 2022 with God stronger than ever, to confirm that the Holy Ghost is on the inside of you, to confirm that you have that still small voice on the inside of you, to confirm that the third part of the Godhead is all over you, to confirm that you've been born again, the Bible says you will be convicted the Holy Spirit will prove the world wrong about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. Let me say it more plainly to make sure you have it in your notes. Brothers and sisters, when you feel an awareness in your life, when you feel an awareness on the inside of you, an awareness of sin, an awareness of righteousness, an awareness of judgment, and when that awareness that you feel on the inside of you goes against your natural nature, what you really want to do and how you really feel, and when it goes against the natural and pulls you to a higher place, pulls you to the supernatural, pulls you to a higher calling, congratulations, you've confirmed you've been born again. When that awareness gives you an awareness of purpose and power in your life and you recognize in your heart and in your mind, this extends beyond anything that you could even think or even imagine. Congratulations. You've confirmed that you've been born again. You can confirm that you've been born again. You can confirm that you are walking into this new year with the same God. You can be reminded of how good God is and how much favor you have in your life. And I believe what I know. And I know what I believe because something on the inside of me convicts me. It, something on the inside of me makes me aware of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. This, brothers and sisters, is how you can confirm that you've been born again. And it is the first step to making sure that you confirm Christ after Christmas. Let me break each one of these down for you. The confirmation that I've been born again comes from the awareness of God's will and God's way in my life. The three areas that Jesus says here that Jesus will confirm for you that you have been born again is that Jesus will send the Holy Spirit when you've accepted Christ in the pardon of your life. And the Holy Spirit that you have received will convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Will make you aware of sin, which, make, which means it will, uh, the Holy Spirit will make you aware of the areas of our lives where we are separated from God. Will make you aware of righteousness, which means that the Holy Spirit will make you aware of not the right thing to do, but the righteous thing to do in your life. And will make you aware of judgment. Judgment is being made aware of the godly response to sin, the spiritual thing to do to correct a wrong. Let's deal with these deeply. The Holy Ghost will come into your life and confirm that you've been born again by making you aware of sin. The example that I always tell people is, were it not for the sign telling me the speed limit, I'd never know I was breaking the law or how fast I was driving. And therefore, were it not for the Holy Spirit on the inside of me, I'd never know I was breaking God's law. 
Sure, the Bible tells me the major things I should not do. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not murder. But on a given day, in a given conversation, at a given moment, how do I know that I'm inside of God's will? How do I know that I'm doing the things that God would have me to do? Going the places God would have me to go? Saying the things God would have me to say? Thinking the things God would have me to think? I know it because there's a Holy Spirit making me aware on the inside. Friends, I've come to tell you this morning, you can confirm that you've been born again when you know the Holy Spirit is making you aware of God's will. Hear me, hear me. The Holy Ghost makes you aware of sin. The Holy Ghost doesn't stop you from sinning. The Holy Ghost makes you aware of sin. Just because you see the speed limit doesn't stop me from speeding. Just makes me aware that based upon how fast I'm going, I'm speeding. Somebody say amen. And if you just got a ticket this past week, don't say amen, say ouch. The Holy Ghost will make you aware of the ways in which you and I have been separated from God. Listen, mama and daddy raised you right. So therefore, you are aware of right and wrong, the things that you should do and the things that you should not do. You should take your trash cans back around your house immediately after the trash person comes and picks them up. You should not leave them in front of your house for a day or two days after the trash person picks them up. See, you've been raised right, so you know one of those things is right and one of those things is wrong. That's what your parents teach you. But you see, God teaches you that which is inside of God's will and that which is outside of God's will. And see, the things that your parents taught you are supposed to be universal for an entire community or society that we live in. But the things that God teaches us when the Holy Spirit convicts us, it is specific to your life. There are some things that you might do that are inside of God's will that if I do are outside of God's will. Because that which will separate me from God is different than that which will separate you from God. And the only person who can delineate the difference between the two is the Holy Ghost, which is why the Holy Ghost speaks to you and the Holy Ghost speaks to me. If you feel the conviction on the inside of you, if you are being made aware of the ways in which God is telling you you are separated from the will and the way of God in your life, congratulations, that is step one of confirming that you've been born again. Then it says the Holy Ghost will not only convict you of sin, but will convict you of righteousness. Righteousness, we talk about this all the time in Providence. There's a fundamental difference between being right and being righteousness. Your parents and our community and our society raise you in rightness. But your church, your God and the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord raise you in righteousness. Righteousness are the standards of God, not just the standards of our laws or our community. Righteousness are the standards of God that transcend right versus wrong because God's will is above all in our lives. Think about it like this. Was it right that an innocent man named Jesus had to die, be arrested, beaten and crucified for sins he did not commit? No, that's not right, but it was righteous. It was God's will for Jesus's life. So even though it wasn't the right thing based upon what my mother taught me and what your mother taught you, it still was the righteous thing because it was God's will. Friends, in your life, if you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit convicting you of the righteous thing to do in a situation, a situation that may not necessarily feel right to you, it may go against what mom and daddy taught you, but God is calling you to stretch beyond to stretch higher, to stretch further than ways in which you thought you could ever go. Congratulations, you are being convicted of righteousness. Righteousness ensures two things. Jot this down in your notes. Thing number one is that God will always get the glory. Thing number two is that sacrifice will help somebody else. To engage the righteous thing in this life, you know that you are walking in righteousness. You know the Holy Ghost is convicting you of righteousness. If A, God gets the glory out of the situation, and B, your sacrifice will be a blessing to somebody else. God's glory and the blessings of others always translates to righteousness. If you don't think I'm right about it, let's read Proverbs together, and you'll see that the Lord reminds us of what it means to be righteous. The Holy Ghost will come into your life to confirm that you've been born again, will convict you of sin and will convict you of righteousness. And then the final thing it says in the text is that the Holy Spirit will convict you of judgment. Here's the truth, brothers and sisters. There will be judgment in our lives 
we will engage judgment because we will sin. We are imperfect creatures at best. Every single one of us, from the pastor to the pew, we all make mistakes. And yes, we are forgiven, but in righteousness, there are consequences to our actions and there are recompense for the mistakes. Remember my speeding example? The government of our country wants my money as recompense for my speeding. You speed, you get a ticket. And most often that ticket simply involves you having to pay some money to the municipality that you were in. Your paying of the money is the judgment. It is the, the recompense for the mistake that you made of breaking the law. Well, when we break God's law, there are times when the Holy Spirit makes us aware of that which we must do to make recompense for the mistake that we have made. If in your life, when you know you've made a mistake, when you know you've gone outside the will of God, if you find that there are times when the Holy Spirit is making you aware and convicting you on the inside of here's what I am calling you to do to make recompense for the mistake that you have made, congratulations. You are receiving conviction of the Holy Spirit. You have been born again. Have you ever fell out with somebody in your life and God told you what to do and how to reconcile? You heard the Lord convicting you in your spirit. You say, oh God, I don't want to, but I know what I'm supposed to do. Congratulations. That's conviction. Have you ever seen something that you wanted to keep for yourself, but God told you to give it up, give it to somebody else, bless somebody else. Congratulations. That is conviction. Brothers and sisters, in this 16th chapter of John, as Jesus is preparing for his final days on the planet, he teaches his disciples, you can confirm that you're walking with me. You can confirm that you are part of this movement. You can confirm that you are part of this ministry because the Holy Spirit will prove the world wrong. The Holy Spirit will convict you, will make you aware, will prove the world wrong, will make you aware of the ways in which the world is wrong and God is right. And all the days of your life, as you and I receive the conviction of the Holy Spirit, as we receive the awareness of sin, the awareness of righteousness and awareness of judgment, even though we sometimes struggle to do it, the mere fact that you've received the conviction, you ought to thank God. The mere fact you will receive the conviction is what you and I praise God about because it means that you have truly been born again. Receive the conviction of the Lord. Allow the Holy Spirit to make you aware of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And you will be able to confirm today that you have been born again. Being born again. This is the moment that we all look forward to in our lives. It is the transcendent moment when we've accepted Jesus Christ in our lives and we know we shall spend eternity with the Lord. Being born again is the new creature that can come from the inside of me because the Holy Spirit will now dwell within me. It is that opportunity to be born again that I would like to offer you now. When you think about confirming that you've been born again, you have to think about that text that comes out of the book of Romans. It says, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Oh, my brother, oh, my sister, this morning I'm talking to the person who does not know Christ and the pardon of their sins, but you would like to. I'm talking to the person who has come online to worship because you know you need a church home, a family, even from a distance, who can wrap their arms around you and help you grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. I'm talking to the person who needs a season of time for a different church to watch over your soul. If you're ready, then we're ready for you to come home. I'm going to ask you two questions. Number one. This morning, will you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord? If you will, simply close your eyes to the Holy Ghost and say, yes, I do. 
My brother or sister, this morning, will you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? Simply close your eyes and say to the Holy Spirit, yes, I do. Then my friend, if you said yes to both those questions, you are saved and you are going to heaven. On your way to heaven, there's a church family that is here waiting for you to receive you and to love you. At the bottom of your screen right now, you will see the phone number of our church family where we are waiting to tell you how to accept this Christ.